tell people about what growth hormone is, where it comes from, you know, what are the challenges of measuring it? Let's, let's just do kind of a growth hormone 101. Yeah, so growth hormone is, most people know it as like the primary hormone responsible for determining height as you grow in adolescence. Like, you know, androgens are more sexual differentiation, maturation, but um, growth hormone and the subsequent growth factor production, IGF-1, will be a fairly significant determinant on if you grow to, I guess, like target height, whatever you could become. And it's pretty, like during puberty especially, pretty important for the proper development of your infrastructure, bone, et cetera, connective tissue. As you get into adulthood, it becomes one of those things where it drops significantly, first off, as you reach adulthood. And as you get older, it drops precipitously as well. And that kind of begs the question, is this one of those things that you should be replacing to optimize, you know, function, fat loss, vitality, what have you. And it's tough because a lot of the proponents that assert such things have financial incentive. And it's kind of hard to wade through the nonsense and kind of figure out what is the truth here. And it is often framed out to be like this fountain of youth elixir, you know, HGH. Oh, it's, you know, so cost prohibitive. It's what all the pro athletes are using. This is the thing you need to be on to prevent any age related decline in, you know, bone strength, uh, you know, not your ability to burn fat as you get older is going to go down. So you need to be on growth hormone, et cetera, et cetera. And that is kind of uh, like at a bird's eye view, it's kind of responsible for the growth of broad spectrum growth of tissues as you grow up. And then as you get into adulthood, it becomes, it's not irrelevant, but it's far less important because you're not trying to, you know, push a human from, you know, childhood into adulthood, essentially. And even when you have this push of exogenous growth hormone to manually manipulate your levels after it's called epiphyseal plate closure, there does not seem to be any benefit to be gained from enhancing like the length of bones, for example, like you could still enhance um, bone mineral density to some extent. And it seems to be, you know, you could enhance connective tissue integrity, it kind of depends on what your situation is and how IGF one deficient or lack thereof you are. But it's not going to impact your height in adulthood. It's not going to really do anything other than regulate um, like lipolytic action. Um, how does it do that, by the way? It just like liberates free fatty acids into circulation. So it's kind of seen as the opposing hormone to insulin. So it's like when growth. Does it do that through lipoprotein lipase? I mean, what is it actually acting on a substrate with on the adipocyte? That it seems to be driven through different like baseline, I don't know, states that you're in. Like if you have, you know, ghrelin receptor agonism from being fasted, for example, a lot of people point to the literature on if you're deprived of calories, oh, growth hormone goes up. If there are different situations in which it'll go up, deep sleep, obviously super impactful on if you're going to have release or not as well. But the main actions that I'm aware of at least in a state of growth hormone pulsation is kind of the underpinnings are you are trying to liberate free fatty acids for utilization as substrate for energy or anti catabolic action. So the actual like mechanism enzymatically and whatnot, it's a bit fuzzy. And what's the relationship then between GH and IGF in the liver? How does this all work? Because we don't really measure GH in people, right? Because it's pulsatile. So what are we stuck with as a proxy? Yeah, even if you inject GH, like a large dose of it, you will only see a spike in serum for a transient period of time. And people who are trying to assess the quality of their growth hormone back in the, you know, with the underground stuff, they would be trying to time it very specifically down to the minute to assess the quality of their stuff. But the best proxy for GH production endogenously seems to be widely accepted as IGF-1, which is after you produce growth hormone from the pituitary, there is action in the liver, but also paracrine and autocrine action on, you know, muscle, especially if you are exercising, resistance training. But a lot of the serum IGF-1 is driven through liver production, and that is has its own implications in terms of its effects that seem to be more, it's like intelligenic in itself to some extent. And, um, 
Yeah, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Because if IGF-1 has insulogenic properties, which are promoting a fat storage, and GH is promoting lipolysis, don't those act at odds with each other? And how, 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 does, how does one sort of uh, become more dominant? Yeah, it's this weird orchestrated feedback loop. And these feedback loops are present in the body in multiple, you know, multiple different, uh, I don't know, hormone substrates will reduce in multiple different metabolites that then have negative feedback through different systems. And this seems to be no different. If you have GH at a certain level and it results in a certain amount of IGF-1, you will have negative feedback that will then lower your production of HGH while the IGF-1 is elevated. And as it declines, you have this decrease in inhibitory feedback that then tells your body, okay, now the IGF-1 is not present in significant quantities. It's okay to, you know, release GH again. So it's this like finely tuned balancing act in your body where your body has kind of like counteracting things. It's not counteracting, but it's like the balance between anabolic or anti-catabolic is it's kind of hard to and frankly i don't even know how to elucidate in like a super clear way that is completely accurate but it's it seems to be kind of uh when one is high the other one would be low and conversely in order to kind of maintain a not necessarily at the same times but to maintain like a balancing act in the body so we have a real sense of how to dose for example, testosterone or mm -hmm. estradiol in the case of uh, HRT for women, because we know what physiologic normal levels are during various periods of a person's life. And so if we're replacing testosterone to the level that we think is normal, either for your age or for some earlier age, we can measure the hormone, we administer it, and we can do the calculation. Hey, this person yeah. has a lot of sex hormone binding globulin, or they don't, or whatever the case might be. When when people are administering growth hormone, and again, let's just talk about this through the lens of the context you're talking about it now, which is, you know, rejuvenation or, you know, whatever, called longevity, the, the wastebasket term. How do they know that, you know, because typically they're using about one to two units per day. Isn't that the typical dose? Yeah, it depends largely on liver function too. So some people with compromised function or type 1 diabetics, for example, they could have super high GH production, but very low IGF-1 from seemingly lack of insulogenic signaling because it also has a positive relationship with IGF-1 production. Mm -hmm. But that is, it, it can be difficult because you could have a person on a ketogenic calorie deprived diet model who has an IGF-1 that is on the low end of the reference range be manually administering growth hormone and be using a higher dose than would otherwise be necessary to get to high normal optimal function, put in quotation marks. Um, so it, that's the best proxy we have as far as I'm aware is that serum biomarker IGF-1, but there's not really, you know, a uh, cut and dry way to so people would use the Z score, presumably, of their IGF one as the dosing, as the output for determining how much GH to administer. Yeah, my understanding is that regardless of its idiopathic short stature, GH deficiency, they would use IGF one as a metric to kind of dial in the dose. So if your IGF one is higher than it, the target, then you would dial the dose back accordingly. Or if it's not high enough, then you would. And what do they what do they target? A Z score of one to two, meaning one to two standard deviations above the mean is therapeutic, or just being above zero, for example, which means you're above the fiftieth percentile. The target for. I think it's mainly just correcting, but as far as what is correct, I guess the reference range, if it's in the middle or the high end of normal, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's something in the neighborhood of middle of a standard LabCorp reference range as far as I know. It could be off on that, but. Yeah. So, okay, so let's talk about the physiology of this. So you give GH, there's a feedback signal because GH comes from the pituitary, but it's spoken to by the hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about this again when we talk about testosterone, of course, because that's a really obvious issue. So what happens upstream of the pituitary, i.e. what happens to the signal from the th hypothalamus to the pituitary to make endogenous, to make your own growth hormone when you take it from the outside? Does that get shut off as well? 
Yeah, the negative feedback that I spoke about briefly, when you have elevated IGF-1, it will give negative feedback, and there is an elevation, something called somatostatin, which is like a, basically tells your body, don't make as much GH, essentially. And there is different receptors, which gets a bit confusing as to how you produce the growth hormone upstream. There's the ghrelin receptor, which super confusingly is also called like the GH receptor, I believe it's also called. And then you have the GHRH receptor and the production of GHRH endogenously, as well as the agonism of ghrelin receptors can both stimulate growth hormone and the way by which they achieve your end output can be different. And that's why there's different drugs that target different receptors for actual elevation. Typically, GHRH drugs are coupled with GHRPs to get like a one plus one equals three effect of sorts. But this is why also when you are fasted or malnourished, you could have significantly more output via the ghrelin receptor agonism as that is the and this is the same ghrelin hormone that plays an important role in management of hunger yeah so for people who don't know ghrelin is like i don't know if it's the primary but i think it's probably pretty accepted that leptin and ghrelin are kind of like the signals that you're full versus hungry so ghrelin and ghrelin receptor agonism is what would tell your brain you're hungry so for example if you gave somebody a really potent ghrelin receptor agonist like ibutamoran is a commonly orally bioavailable ghrp you use that even if you're not hungry you'll want to eat your pantry like it's insane so that compound plus a ghrh will seemingly have a downward pressure on somatostatin activity and simultaneously increase the output from the pituitary to produce more GH. So you can kind of like max out your endogenous production through these peptides essentially. But those are the primary mechanisms involved. Like those three things is the ghrelin receptor, GHRH, and then also somatostatin as a negative feedback. So if someone is just taking exogenous growth hormone and, um, how, how long would they need to take it before they would start to compromise their own ability to make endogenous growth hormone once they came off? It? Um, I think it's pretty quick. Like IGF-1 elevations are not instant. Like in the serum, you would see GH spikes in a matter of minutes. Like it's very transient in and out of your system, very short half-life, but the downstream IGF-1 conversion can increase over days and then stay elevated for days and this is why igf1 as a biomarker has been asserted to be a potential way to catch people doping further out than the hgh isoform differential amino assay which is the current accepted gold standard test that they use um because igf1 will stay elevated for a relatively long period of time but let's just say a person's on gh for two years mm -hmm. And then they stop it. Yeah. Does their pituitary go back to making GH? Yeah, seemingly. It seems pretty flexible in that. So in that sense, it's different than LH and FSH and the testes making testosterone. Yeah. And the reason for that, I can't help but think there's, because there's multiple actions of the pituitary, it's not going to atrophy in the same way, I would think. And this is just speculative. But for example, people always want to know if I take anabolics or testosterone replacement for years, but I don't take HCG or I don't take these fertility drugs, will I be able to restore fertility in short order? And it seems to be like a use it or lose it kind of thing where not necessarily, but it's more difficult to restore fertility in somebody yep. with like severely atrophied organs that has not had stimulation directly for years versus the pituitary does multiple different things. So I can only imagine that, you know, the maintenance of output of other hormones and things are at least maintaining its flexibility to some extent, yeah. but that, that's super speculative. Let's talk a little bit about the use of GH in uh, restoration of tissue during periods of healing. So um, I think there's some accepted medical use for GH in burn victims, for example, right? So, um, if a person sub sustains a significant enough burn, um, enough of their, their body surface area is burnt, 
I mean, that's one of the most catabolic activities mm. that a human can sustain. And therefore the reversal of that is one of the most anabolic demands that a, a human can sustain as an adult. Um, what about during, you know, orthopedic injuries? So you look at a person who's having either elective or emergent surgery for an injury, uh, you know, well, I'll give you an example. So, so we've had patients who have had injuries, so like a torn bicep. Mm. And, you know, we've looked at the literature, found, I would say, at best modest evidence suggesting maybe for that person, um, you know, an eight-week course of anabolic steroids and growth hormone can aid in recuperation. Mm. You know, the few times we've done this, We've seen great outcomes, but that means nothing. It's so anecdotal. We'd have no, you know, mm -hmm. we have no contrapositive uh, or, 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 you know, con you know, opposite view there of what would happen otherwise. So, do you have any insight either from kind of literature or from just kind of the underground world as to what the use of modest amounts of growth hormone would look like in periods of rehabilitation? Yeah, it's more anecdotal because, like you said, you could find very yeah. There's just no counterfactuals to any of these stories. Yeah, and oftentimes when we're <laughs> when I'm talking about this stuff, I want to say it's not necessarily founded in literature. Unfortunately, it's kind of a mix of extrapolations, rodent studies, anecdotes in humans, stuff like that. Which is unfortunate. I would love to be able to make like hard hitting factual statements every time I say something on this stuff. But with GH. Anecdotally, it seems to be quite effective in rehabilitation. I think that it is worthwhile in an acute time frame. Like that's where the ROI makes sense, in my opinion. So I do see people, but again, it's not like you have a control of that same guy with the injury yep. not taking it. So we can only go by what you discern to be a reasonable, I don't know, recovery period. And then, well, it seems like it's recovering quicker than you would have expected. Good probably good.